iOS engineer. And today I'm going to speak about ML model creation and injection in iOS app. So let's begin. Um, according to today's agenda, first I will give a brief explanation on deep learning and the CNN algorithm. Uh, Pre-processing of the MRI images will also be explained in order to show how the data has been pre-processed before training. On the next point, model creation along with training and validation will be shown regarding the model which I have created. After that, a way of injecting that model into an iOS app will be shown, which will be followed by steps of how we can actually use that model into the app. And as a final point, I have also prepared a short demo of the aforementioned model. So now we can proceed on to the next slide. We will start with deep learning and CNN algorithm as being our first section of the presentation. So to get a better understanding of uh, the deep learning, Let's begin with artificial intelligence or AI for short. Imagine an overlapping concentric circles. The largest circle would be the AI followed by machine learning and deep learning taking the smallest one. By saying that we can derive that deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which in turn is a subset of AI. So in other words, we can conclude that deep learning is AI, but not the other way around. Compared to the machine learning, deep learning process and learn features on its own automatically without the need of developing complicated feature extraction patterns. Also, it utilizes artificial neural networks, which consist of nodes or neurons through which the data and computations flow. These type of networks are inspired by the human brain. On figure one, we can see that machine oh, learning- oh. <laughs> uh, Sorry? Sorry, everything is okay, just someone uh, yeah. unmute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on figure one, we can actually see that machine learning has feature extraction, which sometimes could be a very tedious process requiring experts. For example, if we want to classify some medical disease by feeding the AI model with images, machine learning model would require feature extraction, which in turn may require docs, doctors, for instance, or experts. On the other hand, deep learning is handling that on the fly. The convolutional neural networks, are, or CNNs for short, are type of artificial neural networks which are widely used in image or object recognition and classification. CNN architecture is constructed through several stages of layers, accepting inputs of 1D, 2D, or 3D array formats, such as text, images, or even volumetric images. The layers at the starting point of the network are called convolutional layers which convolve the input using kernel into feature map. So this could be visualized on this figure two. So it, a sample kernel could be seen on figure two of how it is convolving the input. In this case, the kernel is three by three in size and it is traversing the image in order to convolve and receive a feature map. Moreover, pooling layers could also be deployed for more condensed feature map. They also traverse the image, reducing the special size of the representation, which in turn decreased the required amount of computation and weights. This also helps us with uh, less parameters or hyperparameters for the computer to compute. That, that, that would be very beneficial for our machines. Also, there are several, several pooling functions and also max pool, pooling being the most famous and also it is used in this presentation. Several stacks of these layers can be combined to discover complex structures or patterns in the data automatically. As a final point, at the end of the network, there, are fully, uh, there is fully connected layer, which will have full connectivity with all neurons or nodes in the preceding and succeeding layer. They flatten the output of the pooling layers and classify the result. Finally, several famous CNN models are displayed on the screen. The first one being, for example, the Linet 5, which is able to recognize handwritten and machine printed characters, where the two, the, the, the other two models, the AlexNet and the VGG16, are able to classify images into 1,000 categories, which is a lot. This would be all about these models as they are out of scope for this presentation. So regarding this slide, is there any questions so far? All right, we can then proceed with the next section. This section 
After giving the overview on the deep learning and the CNN algorithm, we are going to dive deeper into the actual work of preparing the data. Here we are going to talk about the MRI images and their pre-processing steps. The next slide will show the data which I have used for training the model. Um, the model which I'm going to propose later into the section is going to take 2D images in order to diagnose whether a patient has Alzheimer's disease. Any details about the Alzheimer's disease are out of scope for this presentation, so we are going to only focus on the image pre-processing for this section. The figure on the right shows a three-dimensional MRI image with axial, sagittal, and coronal plane of the brain. Worth mentioning is that after a research was done, it was concluded that the coronal plane of the brain would be the most informative part for training the custom architecture of my model. After gathering the 3D MRI images from multiple sources, they were fed through a pipeline command to the FreeSurfer software, performing five pre-processing steps. These steps uh, are mentioned on the slide as points, and the results of each step is displayed on figure four. At the end of the pipeline, the MRIs were sized to 256 pixels in all dimensions, as they are three-dimensional images. As the model accepts 2D images, slicing procedure was applied, and only the coronal plane of the brain was extracted. This resulted into 256 images depicting coronal plane, as the 3D MRIs provide a lot of projections of the brain. Basically, there are three projections, as I already mentioned on the previous figure. However, most of the 2D images showed little to no information. So this is why an entropy-based selection was performed on MATLAB to calculate the amount of content on a single image. Thus, only 32 slices were taken from each MRI, which contained enough information. Finally, the sliced images were resized to even uh, 200 by 200 pixels in order to exclude the excessive background, which was black in this case. The excessive background could be seen on figure four, uh, phase five. It was a lot. So the result of removing the background can be seen on the next figure, figure five. Here, six random images from the data set are displayed, which underwent the whole pre-processing steps, the slicing procedure, and the entropy-based selection and the removal of the background. So at the end of this slide, I want to ask again, is there any questions here before going to the next one? All right. Uh, on this slide, just for informational purposes, uh, the demographics are shown, which display the MRI scans by gender and age, which were used for training the model. It could be seen that the MRIs of males are slightly more compared to females, and also that a lot of MRIs were obtained from people between the age of 76 and 85. Worth mentioning is that some of the patients have undergone several scans of their brain. This is why the people are less on the left diagram compared to the taken MRIs on the right one. This would be the overview of the demographics of the used data set in the model. So we can now switch to the next section. That would be about model creation, training, and validation. So the next slide will actually present the model creation. For the creation of the model, several technologies have been used. So we can begin with the first one, which is Python, and it was the primary programming language used for, for creating the model on Keras. Keras, on the other hand, is a high-level neural network API that runs on top of TensorFlow. I might say that Keras is usually uh, used for easily building and training model. TensorFlow, on the other hand, is an open-source end-to-end platform used for neur neural networks. It has great ecosystem of community resources, which utilizes libraries and tools that facilitated building and deploying machine learning, as well as deep learning apps. Moreover, Keras was adopted by TensorFlow in 2017, so now it is part of TensorFlow functionality. There is no need to actually install that as it is uh, out of the package uh, with TensorFlow. Jupyter Notebook, which is the next point, is a server client that allows editing and running notebook documents on a web browser. The, uh, the notebook app can be executed lo locally or on a remote machine and accessed via internet. In this case, it was installed locally on the machine using Anaconda. 
So moving to the next point, Anaconda is a software that actually helps you create an environment for many different Python and package versions. It aims to simplify package management and deployment. With that being said, that would be all for the use technologies. So now for the actual model, I'm going to propose custom model architecture, which could be seen on figure six. By evoking summary function into Jupyter's notebook on the already compiled model, layers could be seen with their outputs. The first convolutional layer takes an input of 200 by 200 pixel, pixels and returns an output of 100 by 100 pixels, which is then inputted into the next convolutional layer. This process follows till the end of the model, where the fully connected layers, or as it is called in Keras, dense layer, will classify the result into two categories, whether the patient has Alzheimer or not. Worth mentioning is that in this model, two dropout layers were included to prevent the model of a common problem called overfitting. This happens when the model tries to fit the training data entirely and ends up performing poor on a new unseen data, defeating the model's purpose. Um, for the purpose of clarification, the next figure is showing creation of a simple model with one convolutional, one max pooling, along with flatten and two fully connected layers. The required libraries are imported on the top, and it could be seen how simple the creation of the model could be using Keras, just specifying the required layer and providing it with the required parameters. After creating the model, it should be compiled using suitable loss function, optimizer, and evaluation metric. The first one is used to calculate the difference between the predicted and the actual values that the, our model gives. The next one is updating the weights of the model during training. And the last one is to measure the performance of the model. With all that information set, our model being created and compiled, we can go to the next slide explaining training and the validation process. Before training the model, we need to create train and validation generators for that purpose. I have written Python function, which is displayed on figure eight. It takes three parameters, which are the train and test paths to the already pre-processed images and a batch size, which will regulate how many images would be passed each time to the model. Image data generator class was used to rescale the images and augment the train data set by randomly rotating them by 50 degrees. After that, train and validation generators are created by specifying multiple parameters, such as the target size, directory of the images, color mode, and others. Successfully creating the aforementioned, we can begin training the model. So let me switch to the next figure. For that purpose, we need to use a method called fit generator on the model and provided with the train and validation generators, which were shown on the previous figure. There is also a parameter called epochs, which is defining, de defining one training cycle of the neural network with all the training data. So in our case, there are 150 epochs, basically cycles. The parameter calls, uh, called steps per epoch is defining how many steps are needed for one cycle to finish, for one epoch to finish. And the last parameter is returning log messages through the whole training process, which we can use as statistic later to see how the model performs, whether it is learning or not. Training of the model is a matter of invo invoking simple function after we have all the necessary data, of course. Now we can switch to the next slide to, to see some interesting information about our model. But before that, is there any questions so far? Actually, could you please tell which activation functions you, you used? I saw on a picture, on a previous picture, that that was a ReLU and a Softmax, but did you try any others? Or that's just the, the most applicable here? At least for the uh, ReLU is uh, the most famous function, at least what it is being used uh, in the convolutional layers. And for the Softmax, I decided to use it for the binary uh, categorization because I have only two classes, but you can also use instead of softmax, you can use also binary. But uh, as softmax and ReLU are the most famous used, and my architecture is a custom one, I decided just to try with them and see what will be the result. But uh, in terms of the deep learning, you can play with many different hyperparameters. So this is a subject to change, and you can always improve your model by 
adding something or change uh, some of the functions and algorithms used in this model. Got it, thanks. Okay. Um, so switching to the next slide. Here on this slide, just for the informational purposes, it is shown how the first and the last convolutional layers apply different filters in the proposed architecture of the four CNN model, and also the level of abstraction which is achieved here. It increases as we go deep down into the layers. 64 filters are applied in the first layer compared to the 180, uh, uh, 128 filters in the last convolutional layer. It could be seen how abstract the features uh, which are extracted become. Another interesting thing, of course, is the uh, would be the extracted convolutional features of the images. So starting from the top row of the figures, they, they represent the first convolutional layer in the model and the bottom row representing the last convolutional layer respectively. It can be seen what each convolutional layer is finding as an interesting area in the training image, which actually influenced the decision at the end of the model. For a healthy patient, which is the figure 11 on the left, the model seems to look more at the outer layer of the brain called the neocortex, where for the Alzheimer patient, hippocampus along with the ventricles are the main characteristic picked by the model. On figure 12, the red squares depict the hippocampus, which is responsible for our short memory. Moreover, Alzheimer's disease is known for affecting hippocampus and the model successfully targets that area in the image of an Alzheimer patient. So that would be all about model creation, training and validation. Um, we can now switch to the next section, but before that also, is there any questions about this slide? What training method was used? Was that back, back propagation? Yep. Uh, when when you try, yeah, it was back propagation. So when it actually tries and uh, figures out what is the class, I'm using supervised learning, uh, which is giving labels to the inputs. And the model, when it classifies during its weights and biases, uh, it sees whether the, the actual result is right to the label. So it was back propagation to actually uh, adjust those weights. Uh, but according to these slides, these are just the heat maps. Uh, of what the models is actually uh, interested in. And what about the data source? Is it like an open source one? I mean, the MRI images, the MRI scans. Oh, sorry? Was it, what was like the data source, the MRI images, are they open source? Like they are available for everyone or that's some specific access to the data from clinics or so? Uh, some of the MRI images are available publicly. For example, the ADNI organization is for the Alzheimer's disease uh, organization providing free MRI images, but also you need to apply for that and give the reason of why you're going to use that images. Some of them are closed. They are not publicly available, for example, in hospitals or even other sources online. But for example, I know only ADNI and OASIS as two online sources from which we can take MRI images. There is a lot of uh, database around that. But also keep in mind that if you're going to use that, uh, you need to go and look after each MRI because not all of them are perfectly uh, taken. So some of the brain could be out of the image, for example. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's proceed with the next section then, which is the injection and usage of model inside iOS app. So I'm going to explore here the way of the injecting the deep learning model, which I have proposed into an iOS app. For the purpose of converting Keras model into neural network for the iOS system, we need to install and import CoreML tools into Jupyter's notebook. CoreML Tools is an official Apple library which helps us with the conversion and editing of Keras models. On figure 13, I have displayed Python code for the conversion. First, I have specified the parent path containing my already created and trained model. After that, certain properties were defined, including the input layer's name of the model, along with the class labels which the model is able to identify. One important step during the conversion process is to specify that the model which we are trying to convert will accept input image type. This will allow when imported into Xcode to pass, for example, CG image into the model instead of some complex multi-array as Keras is actually demanding. 
After all these steps are completed, we are able to convert the model by passing the aforementioned into the convert function. That will convert the model and we can then save it onto the disk. Besides that, we can make also little improvements in the model. And by saying that, I, I mean that we can specify the author on, and giving short description and changing also the layer's name. So on figure 14, the first convolutional layer has been remained from conv2d underscore four underscore input to MRI image. This was done as later Xcode will auto generate some code and it will include this long name as a parameter into the input function. Of course, this is an optional step and it's not necessary. It was done only for readability purposes. This would be the conversion procedure. So we can now shift to the injection of the converted model. So on injecting the, injection, uh, injecting the model into the iOS app could be easily done by just importing the model file, which we converted in the previous slide into Xcode project. On this slide on figure 15, it could be seen that there is a lot of information regarding the model. Several tabs are provided to us and worth mentioning is that from the preview tab, we can put an image and see the result without even implementing anything in the app. Another, also another thing with, uh, which will minimize the work is that Xcode will auto-generate mod the model class. In this case, it is called an Alzheimer, it's called Alzheimer disease as Xcode picks the model class name from the model's file name, which we imported into the model. So if we want to be something else, then we need to re uh, rename the model's file, file name. And for demonstration purposes, I have created a simple app visualizing the aforementioned. So I think now it's the time for a short demo. And of course, before that, is there any questions before proceeding with the demo? All right. Is the in inference hardware accelerated in this case? Sorry? Uh, is there like uh, dedicated hardware in the, in the Apple uh, hardware for inference on those models? Yeah, I think it, uh, it could be also enhanced by metal uh, as the graphical hardware for the model, it, it just depends on how, um, how big is our model. In this case, it's only 33 megabytes. Uh, there is small percentage of hyperparameters, so the result should be fast and it could be utilized by the CPU. But in some cases, for example, lifetime preview, for example, if we want to recognize some real-time objects in real time, then probably the metal would be in help for, for the Apple, uh, for, for the model. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's switch to the demo now. Uh, so I've created just a simple project called Core ML Sample. Just load the project. So the Alzheimer disease, which could be seen into the resource folder, is providing it with what I showed on figure. Uh, 15. We have the metadata, class labels, additional things, also layer distribution. But the more interesting part here is that without even implementing anything in the class, I can click on preview and actually fit it, fit the model with some image. So let me give some example. So the, I have two images which I have extracted from my data set, which is the AP, which stands for Alzheimer patient, and, and NP, HP, which is for healthy patient. So let me open them just to become clearer. And then if I try to insert, for example, the AP into the model, it will process it. And at the bottom, it will say, what is his decision? In this case, it's Alzheimer patient and it's 100% confident in his decision. When I try for, for the healthy patient is the same thing. It says that it's healthy patient and it's also 100% confident in it. If I try to switch between the images, the same result happens. It tries to, again, uh, pass the image to the model and the model actually trying to recognize what this image is. So besides that, we can also open the utilities. This is worth mentioning that here we can also encrypt the model. And this will be for, for the security purposes if something should be, for example, encrypted and not be available. Also the model update, we can update it to ML model package, which is 
uh, as it can be seen, project containing model packages required Xcode 13. I stick with the other one because it's more, there is more information about it. But also, if I try to update it with the module package, it will happen the same thing. Uh, nothing will actually change for what we have right now. Also, we can archive it and use the cloud development for to actually prepare this model uh, into the, the, the deployment using the cloud kit. So transferring to one of my structs, I want to show the Alzheimer model service, how I have actually imported and created the model. So it's a simple struct showing the model and its class name, as I already said, Alzheimer's disease is the same as the file name of the model. I have the init in which I'm initializing the model by passing just an empty configuration, not adding anything more than that, and actually initializing the Alzheimer's disease. By that, we have the model. And also one simple function here, which is predict. It's taking, uh, it is taking CG image as an input. And this uh, parameter, we are passing it to one more auto-generated function from the core ML, which is the Alzheimer disease input. By that, we're passing only the image and the input will return us the right, uh, the right uh, input for the, our model prediction because our model prediction is expecting a class of Alzheimer's disease input. So when we, try, uh, when we pass the input to the prediction function, we have the output. And from the output, we, we can have class labels, which is basically saying if it's an Alzheimer or a healthy patient. So let me start the simulator and actually show that how it is running in action. Uh, the app is very simple. It's just created to show how the model will actually recognize those images. I may ask a question while it was starting. <laughs> yep, of course. Um, so the question is, what was your intention when you are trying to plug everything inside mobile phone? I'm I'm wondering if there are any commercial perspective of this project. Um, I mean, the commercial uh, uh, side of all of this. Yep, of course. At least for, for this presentation purpose, I, I've been doing the Alzheimer model because, for example, imagine if you're going to an exam examination uh, to the doctor and you're actually having a MRI scan of your head. Uh, the doctors are trying to figure out that multiple days they are requiring further ex experience and expertise in that. And if you have a mobile uh, mobile application about that, you can insert that MRI and just receive on an instant a response of whether this patient has an Alzheimer or not. Of course, an accuracy of the model is a, a substantial thing which should be considered. But if we achieve a great result in that, doctors will be able to at least um, see something, some result faster and act on it, depending or trying to figure it out why this, for example, patient has an Alzheimer, mm -hmm. if he's in a young or in other cases, for example, if you want to recognize some models uh, like different objects, it could be used for blind people because blind people are very handicapped in that way. And for example, he can use his phone as they are using it right now with the uh, screen turned off. They're like tapping and uh, the screen is reading. And if he starts an app like that, for example, recognizing some objects, he can actually turn on his camera and pointing on some object, and the camera will actually say, for example, it's a chair, it's a dog, it's a table. It could be very simple to us, but for a blind person, it could be mm -hmm. a real huge deal breaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another question. Are you planning maybe more some tight connection with uh, the medical, um, with the medical, uh, I'm, for example, with MRI to direct send images to the phone uh, for recognition? For example, maybe using some kind of DICOM or something more, uh, more strict uh, formats which are using inside medicine. Uh, yep, you can use DICOM. Also, the MRI images which I have extracted are nifty format. Uh, so they, they need first to have this pre-processing step which I have explained. This could be incorporated in some, for example, cloud services or some other portion of the app which is outside of uh, iOS to be pre-processed and then sent to the application. Because the Nifty format is basically the medical, also the DICOM, as you mentioned. And this could be done only when we pre-process the image. But we could, we can done, we could do these processes 
uh, of pre-processing uh, instead of actually doing this uh, on your own and then inserting the ready image. We can do it in some other services. Okay, thank you, cool. Thank you. Uh, so for the app, uh, it, as I said, it's a very simple, it's just a single button which opens the photo library. And to compare the images, I'm going, yep, I'm going to open them again, just to see the first image, which I'm displaying right now, the Alzheimer patient would be similar. It is this exact the same as the second one here. We can see the neocortex and also the ventricles are identical to the second one. So when I click to the second one, it actually gives it to the model and it takes the output from the model. And it says that the prediction is that it's an Alzheimer patient. If we do the same thing with the first one, we can also see here the neocortex on the right. It's, it's a very specific for this image and also the ventricles are the same. When I click it, it will just say it's a healthy patient. So it's a very fast model in this case. Uh, there's no like some kind of pre-processing or some backend work, which should be like taking a lot of time. It's very fast. Um, and besides that, also, I want to show something else which the output is returning us. So if we try to output, there is a diagnose, which I rename it earlier in the presentation. So now if we restart the program, and I will place a breakpoint here. Let me just start. It's, it's a bit slow. So when we select, for example, an image and select the second one, which was the Alzheimer patient, we can actually try to, let me clear it, to print the diagnose. And we can see here that I'm receiving two elements, Alzheimer patient and healthy patient that are the class labels, which I'm retrieving by this property class label. But this is basically the final decision of the model. If we want to see what is the percentage of, uh, for example, diagnosing an Alzheimer patient, whether the healthy patient, we can see it into the diagnose, which I've renamed into Keras. So we can see the values here for the Alzheimer is this number and for the healthy patient is this one. So in order to calculate it, we need to use some mathematical function, which is, uh, uh, as I remember, ArcMax, which is basically telling us which is the, uh, what is the biggest number between these two. So in this case, this is the, the Xcode is doing that on the fly and is providing us with the Alzheimer patient that this is the patient with, uh, this is the image and his decision that actually the image has the Alzheimer patient. Uh, so besides that, I think that's for the demo. And also, is there any questions? And would it be possible to re not retrain, but add additional information to the model on the fly? For example, when we are feeding an image to the model in an Xcode or in an app and it predicts the incorrect value and we know that that should be a different one, could we mark this image somehow to be processed and to, to update the weights in our model so it like learns on this image or it's not possible in scope of the ML right now? Uh so I have not investigated uh, that matter, but I know for sure that when we actually convert the model into ML model, we can even train the model even more. And actually, I'm pretty sure that you can mark this image and try to, uh, let's say, update the weights of the model during further training into Xcode, because that's that's the purpose of actually converting the model. It's not just injecting the model into the Xcode, but also you can do training, validation, and probably something more. Awesome, thanks. All right, so that's the end of the presentation. Also, <laughs> if there is any other questions, I'll be very happy to answer it. Otherwise, thank you for participating.